Hey everybody, um, I'm going to, uh, this is a, the first section of the, uh, little book, uh, Trotskyism by, uh, Alexander Kalinikos. Uh, I'm reading this for the purpose of getting a feel for some of the, uh, uh, secondary source commentary on uh, divisions within uh, uh, the Trotskyist movement, uh, particularly around the Russian question. But I think this piece, this piece will have enough uh, information that would be valuable to me uh, to make it worthwhile to uh, read both its uh, read the entire thing, and it's not particularly long, um, I think it's like a hundred pages, uh, but I am going to read, uh, each section as, and upload it to each section as its own piece, um, <clears throat> just so it's a little easier to, for myself, uh, to go back and, uh, um, re-listen to, uh, to the most, uh, the things that are most valuable, uh, to my, uh, current research interest, um, but also because I feel like, uh, if I just uploaded this all as one thing, um, I'd very much run the risk of, uh, not being listened to at all. I don't know about you, but I'm daunted by, uh, long videos. Anyway, I'm gonna read the, this video is the introduction. I'm going to read the prefaces and acknowledgments. As the manuscript of this book was readied for publication in the autumn and winter of 1989, a succession of regimes installed in power in Eastern Europe by Stalin's armies at the end of the Second World War began to collapse under the pressure of popular revolt. This episode, surely one of the most dramatic and most and moving developments of the century suggests that the decline of Stalinism as a political and economic system is irreversible. It is therefore an appropriate moment to reconsider the socialist tradition founded by Leon Trotsky, which since its inception in 1923 has defined itself in opposition to Stalinism. I am writing... In writing this book, I have accumulated various debts. I am in the first place grateful to Frank Parkin, the editor of the series in which this book appears, and to Ray Cunningham at the Open University Press. My understanding of Trotsky's thought and of the various traditions to which it has given rise owes a great deal to Duncan Hallis's writings. My discussions over the years with Chris Bambury have also been very helpful. Both read and commented on the manuscript, as did Tony Cliff and Chris Harmon. I thank them all for their often searching criticisms, even though I have not always followed their advice. While working on this book, I was fortunate enough to meet in Moscow Nadezda Yofa, or Jaffa, J-O-F-F-E, daughter of one of the leaders of the left opposition and a survivor of Stalin's gulags. I would like, therefore, to dedicate this book to the memory of those left oppositionists who perished in the labor camps fighting like the participants in the strike of Vorkuta in 1936-7 for a socialism very different from the regimes currently disintegrating in the East. Okay. So here's the introduction. While Trotskyism has not had a good press among Western social scientists, Leon Trotsky himself is too great a figure to ignore. After his role as one of the chief leaders of the Russian Revolution, president of the St. Petersburg Soviet in both 1905 and 1917, organizer of the October Rising, which brought the Bolsheviks to power, founder of the Red Army and architect of victory during the Civil War of 1918-1921, Trotsky's subsequent fate, exclusion from power by Stalin and his allies after Lenin's death in 1924, exile from the Soviet Union in 1929, and assassination by an agent of what is now called the KGB in 1940, 
lent a tragic quality to a career so intimately involved with the decisive event of the 20th century. Trotsky's formidable intellectual powers as social theorist, political analyst, and writer, perhaps best displayed in the great history of the Russian Revolution, commanded the respect of many wholly unsympathetic to his politics. Moreover, it was his good fortune to have his life recorded by Isaac Deutscher in what is without doubt one of the outstanding biographies of our time. It is an indication of Trotsky's stature that now, 50 years after his murder, one of the main issues in the reappraisal of the past currently underway in the USSR is the demand for an honest appreciation of Trotsky's role in the revolution and its aftermath. But Trotskyism, the intellectual and political tradition founded by Trotsky, is, a, is quite a different manner, matter. One of his lesser biographers, Ronald Segal, Let's see if this is somebody. I don't know if this is the same guy, but it says there's a Ronald Segal, who is a South African activist and writer and editor, founder of the Anti-Apartheid America, Africa South, and the Penguin African Library. Don't know if it's the same guy. Might be, though. Anyway, one of the lesser biographers, Ronald Segal, dismisses Trotskyism as a, quote, factional disorder, end quote. This accurately summarized this the dominant image of Trotskyism as a welter of squabbling sects united as much by their complete irrelevance to the realities of political life as by their endless competition for the mantle of orthodoxy inherited from the prophet. As we shall see, this image has a large degree of truth. Yet the marginality and fragmentation of the Trotskyist movement do not of themselves constitute grounds for dismissing the ideas which Trotskyism the Trotskyist movement embodies and is sought in various ways to develop. Trotskyism as a political current defined itself by the rejection of the two dominant definitions of socialism, those provided by Stalinism in the East and by social democracy in the West, and by the reassertion of what it took to be the traditions of 19th October 1917, of the revolutionary transformation of society by the proletariat democratically organized through workers' councils. The radicalism of these ideas helped condemn the Trotskyists to the margins of the labor movement, but the political vision they conjured up attracted in the early years talents as diverse and remarkable as those of the working class agitator James P. Cannon, the pioneering black writer C.L.R. James, and the surrealist poet André Breton. Um... At least two of those people, C.L.R. James and André Breton, would break with Trotskyism. In the 1930s and 1940s, an astonishingly large number of what later became known as the New York intellectuals became directly or peripherally involved in the American Trotskyist movement. Among them, Saul Bellow, James Burnham, James T. Farrell, Clement Greensburg, excuse me, Greenberg, Sidney Hook, Irving Howe, Seymour, Martin Lipset, Mary McCarthy, and Dwight MacDonald. Um, this is too long of a list for me to look up every single person, but I have pieces by James Burnham, uh, Seymour Martin Lipset, I believe. I believe it, yeah, Seymour Martin, and Dwight MacDonald on the channel. Before drifting rightwards towards Cold War liberalism or neoconservatism. Revived by the commotions of the of 1968 and after, many Trotskyist groups were able to attract a new generation of activists. Many of the most important contemporary Marxist theorists can be seen as working in or from one variant or another of the Trotskyist tradition, among them Neville Alexander. Don't know who that is. Neville Alexander. Neville Alexander was a prominent multilingual 
South Africa a proponent, excuse me, was a proponent, Neville Edward Alexander was a proponent of a multilingual South Africa and a former revolutionary who spent 10 years on Robben Island as a fellow prisoner of Nelson Mandela. Okay, didn't know who he was. Perry Anderson, know him. Daniel Ben Said, know him. Robin Blackburn, Robert Brenner, of course, know him. Pia Brue, you wrote a biography of Trotsky and uh, a big fat book on the German Revolution and one on the Spanish Revolution. Tony Cliff, Hal Draper, Terry Eagleton, Norman Garris, Adolf Gilly, don't know who that is, you gotta look that up. Adolfo Gilly, who lived from 1928 to 20, July 2023, was an Argentine-born Mexican historian and author of various books on the history and, of and politics of Mexico and Latin America. Adolfo Gilly served as professor of history and political science at the School of Social and Political Sciences at the National Autonomous University of Mexico in Mexico City, where Adolfo Gilly taught from 1979. Gilly was well known for his prolific articles in La Jornada, a major Mexico City newspaper. Adolfo Gilly's research particularly focused on globalization and the Zapatista movement centered in the southeastern state of Chiapas. So Adolfo Gilly, Duncan Hallis, Chris Harmon, Nigel Harris, Michael Luvi, and Ernest Mandel. This tradition is best understood as the attempt to continue classical Marxism in conditions defined by, on the one hand, the success of the advanced capitalist countries in weathering revolutionary pressures that were the greatest in the interwar years, and, on the other hand, the betrayal of the hopes raised by the October Revolution by the rise of Stalinism in the USSR and its extension after 1945 to Eastern Europe and China. Deutscher lamented the striking and to a Marxist often humiliating contrast between what I call classical Marxism, that is, the body of thought developed by Marx, Engels, their contemporaries, and after them by Kautsky, Plekhanov, Lenin, Trotsky, Rosa Luxemburg, and the vulgar Marxism, the pseudo-Marxism of the different varieties of social democrats, reformists, Stalinists, Khrushchevites, and their like. The classical Marxism, you know, a description, um, his uh, clinicos characterization of classical Marxism that makes no distinction between the um, early Marxism and Marx is um, is uh, something that uh, other people, um, other scholars of early Marxism would dispute. Anderson, 1976, took up the concept of classical Marxism and argued that those coming within its compass were distinguished by their organic involvement in the working class movement of their day and by a theoretical concentration on the evolution of the capitalist economy. The political forms of bourgeois rule and the strategy and tactics of class struggle. Anderson contrasted this tradition with that of Western Marxism as it crystallized after the Second World War, a collection of thinkers, among them Adorno, Althusser, De La Volpe, Horkheimer, Marcuse, and Sartre, characterized by their distance from any form of political practice and by their preoccupation with questions of philosophy and aesthetics. Trotskyism basing itself as it does on the thought of one of the main practitioners of classical Marxism has generally been intellectually resistant to the themes and vocabulary of Western Marxism. This may help explain the comparative lack of interest in Trotskyism displayed by contemporary social theory, which has on the whole been remarkably receptive to Western Marxism. 
versions of Marxism formulated within the academy are likely to be more palatable to social scientists than those which still aspire to address the concerns and influence the actions of ordinary working people. Russell Jacoby's stimulating 1987 polemical essay, The Last Intellectual, is mourns the passing in the United States of, quote, public intellectuals, writers, and thinkers who address a general and educated audience, end quote. The new York intellectual is representing a passing generation that has not been replaced. The left intelligentsia produced by the movements of the 1960s ended up in the universities where it produces a hermetic academic discourse incomprehensible to outsiders. This change is undeniable and is not confined to the USA. Jacoby adduces various social causes, suburbanization, gentrification, the expansion of higher education, which destroyed the milieu in which the old politically engaged intelligentsia flourished and provided a different and more isolated environment for their successors. No doubt these factors are of great importance, but there is also a political condition which Jacoby ignores. The major political experience shared by many New York intellectuals was their involvement in the Trotskyist movement, which sought systematically to relate religious Resume, relate rigorous theoretical inquiry to practical involvement in the public world. Habits acquired in this context stayed with the New York intellectuals even after they had moved on to very different political commitments. By contrast, the generation of the 1960s left intellectuals tended to encounter forms of Marxism, Western Marxism, or often highly Stalinist variants of Maoism. Um, I would argue that. Maoism is Stalinism, is a Stalinism, and I think a lot of Maoists would well, proudly call themselves Stalinists as well, which made it much more difficult to combine critical theory and political practice. Alistair McIntyre himself, a sometime Trotskyist, has recently stressed the importance of what he calls, quote, traditional constituted inquiry, end quote, where the standards of rational justification themselves emerge from and are part of a history in which they are vindicated by the way in which they transcend the limitations of and provide remedies for the defects of their predecessors within the history of that same tradition. One does not have to accept McIntyre's claim that all criteria of rationality are specific to a particular tradition, let alone the tradition of which he now opts, Augustinian Christianity, to recognize the importance of tracing the manner in which traditions evolve through attempting to resolve the problems internal to them. Augustinianism is the philosophical and theological system of Augustine of Hippo and its subsequent development by other thinkers, notably Boethius, Enzelm of Canterbury and Bonaventure. Among Augustine's most important works are the City of God, De Doctrina Christiana, and Confessions. That's enough for enough information um, about Augustinianism for our purposes. Um, anyway. We shall see that the subsequent history of Trotskyism was shaped by the great crisis of the 1940s, precipitated by the refutation of Trotsky's prediction about the Second World War and its outcomes. The differing responses made to this crisis irrevocably shattered the unity of the Trotskyist movement and produced three main theoretical strands, radically different from one another, but all deriving from Trotsky. The, quote, orthodox Trotskyism, end quote, of various fourth internationals, those revisions of orthodoxy which tended to imply a break with classical Marxism, Schachtman and Castoriadis, for example, and the international socialist tradition founded by Tony Cliff, whose critique of orthodox Marxism was conceived rather as a return to classical Marxism. Yeah. Whose critique of orthodox Trotskyism was conceived rather as a return to classical Marxism. 
It is this process of theoretical development defined by the divergent solutions offered to the crisis of the 1940s, which forms the subject of the present book. What follows is very far from being a history of the Trotskyist movement. The nature of the series in which this book appears, as well as the limitations of my knowledge, dictate this, though I have benefited from the recent explosion of historical research into Trotskyism reflected in the emergence of journals such as uh, uh, or Cahier, Leon Trotsky, and Revolutionary History. The aim of this study is rather to provide an intellectual history of Trotskyism as a political movement. The particular examples given are intended primarily to in illustrate theoretical issues. These illustrations reflect the bias of my knowledge towards British and American Trotskyism. This has the disadvantage that, for example, the Trotskyist movement in Latin America is completely ignored. Despite the fact that some of the most significant organizations are to be found in this region... Sorry, one second. The study's bias does, nevertheless, have the virtue of bringing out the fact that Trotskyism has enjoyed some of its greatest influence comparatively in societies, Britain and the United States, where the general impact of Marxism has been slight. If the history I offer is somewhat stylized, some might say caricatured, it may still serve to dramatize the importance of the issues so fiercely disputed by those who have sought to continue Trotsky's thought. All right, that's the end of the introduction.